Mother Superior and I have interrogated everyone. We made a thorough investigation on our own. I took notes. That's so? Yes, that's the way Father Brown does it. Father Brown? Oh, yes, he's an expert detective. Brown. You wouldn't mean Thad Brown? No, Father Brown. Father Brown. You people have your own detectives now? Oh, my, no. He's not a regular detective. He's more like Mother Superior and myself. Is that right? Yes, he's in England. Solves some really difficult cases. Here, I'll show you. See, right here? The Triple Cross, another exciting Father Brown mystery by G.K. Chesterton. Oh. Yes, I have all but one of the Father Brown books. Well, the Superior has it. I, I get it after she finishes. Mm-hmm. Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. That clip uh, you just heard comes from the big actor uh, from Dragnet. And it was noteworthy because they don't usually mention the names of uh, fictional detectives. That they mentioned Father Brown was uh, really uh, made the series uh, stand out. And indeed, it's, a, it's an enduring uh, detective series. Uh, the Father Brown stories were first written in 1910, two years after G.K. Chesterton had published Orthodoxy. In it, he tried to... Uh, refute in orthodoxy the popular image of the orthodox uh, person as a dull, dumb, superstitious, and easily gullible person. In writing uh, orthodoxy, Chesterton argued that orthodoxy could all actually contain quite a bit of wonder and common sense. And it, it seems he took that idea uh, and he put it in a cassock uh, with Father Brown as he embodied the kind of virtues that Chesterton laid out in his uh, nonfiction book. So, from nonfiction essay to fictional detective. Father Brown was the first of a long line of clergyman detectives, though none have been near as uh, successful. Since the first Father Brown story appeared more than uh, a little more than a hundred years ago, there have been many detectives of all sorts that have come and go. Yet, uh, Father Brown still continues to survive in the public imagination. And probably, uh, in terms of a place in the public imagination, he's lasted longer than any other detective, say, for Sherlock Holmes. Father Brown came to radio in 1945 with his own program. Uh, after uh, several of the Father Brown stories were adapted uh, for, mutu for the mutual uh, broadcasting uh, series Murder Clinic, which featured a series of... Uh, Mysteries featuring the great detectives based on their actual stories. None of the Father Brown series uh, that were on Murder Clinic survive. But we do have this 1945 series. Mutual, at this time, really was the king of mysteries. They had a lot of shows that uh, were going on the last part of the, um, or middle part of the 40s. They revived the Sherlock Holmes series, which we hear on Thursdays. They also did a Poirot series. They had Nick Carter, and they had Michael Shane and the Shadow. So Father Brown made a really good addition to the uh, mutual lineup. The Father Brown series was a combination of adaptations of G.K. Chesterton stories and new stories created for radio, uh, similar to the Sherlock Holmes series we see uh, on Thursdays, where they'll do a pro uh, an episode like The Problem at Fort or Bridge, and then you'll have other episodes like The April Fool's uh, Adventure. This uh, really lent itself to radio, because Father Brown didn't have any full-fledged novels, just short story collections. So we have two episodes that survive we're going to listen to over the next two weeks. The first is an adaptation of a Chesterton story, and the second... Uh, is one that the writers came up with. So we can kind of sample both. So let's go ahead and get into today's episode, The Three Tools of Death. The Adventures of Father Brown. And here he is, Father Brown, the best-loved detective of them all. Humanity produces optimists only because it has never produced a really happy man. When the 
the masterful and exciting pages of G.K. Chesterton comes that fascinating human being, Father Brown, played by Carl Swenson. <laughs> Underneath the modest exterior of Father Brown is the rich character of a generous, deeply human man with a sensitive and quick-witted mind. In addition to being a man of God, he is a man of the world, a man of science, and a brilliant amateur detective. And now, the three tools of death. Facing the afterglow of a beautiful summer sunset, Father Brown sits alone in the study of his modest parish house. He is half dozing when Nora, his housekeeper, enters. Father Brown. Mm. Father Brown. No. <coughs> yes, Nora. <coughs> Well, what time is it? Time for your tea. Here it is, nice and hot. Ah, thank you. Just set it there, please. Were you asleep? Oh, I was in between, Nora, just in between. A beautiful state of being, I assure you. Half out of this world and half in. It's a good thing young Father Peter took over your duties for a day. I told him... Oh. There's somebody at the door. Don't worry, I'll take care of that. No. Oh, good evening, Nora. Father Brown in? I'm sorry, Flambeau, but he's rested. No, no, Nora, you you know Flambeau's always welcome. Tell him to come in. Oh, all right. Come in, come in, Flambeau. Have a cup of tea. Uh, no, thanks, Father. I'm all upset. A friend of mine is in trouble. Oh. Will you come with me to Oakville? My car's outside. Here, here. No, not so fast. Get your breath. Sit down. <sighs> Father, hmm. you've heard of Aaron Armstrong, the philanthropist and lecturer? Yeah. Oh, Armstrong. The author of those bestsellers on how to be happy, etc. Had that such a tremendous following? Yes, Father, that's the one. Oh, uh, yes. I, I read his books. And I attended one of his lectures once in which he offered his followers an easy road to happiness. Or heaven, as he called it. That's the guy, Father. Yes. As I remember, he um, apparently based his teachings on one of the proverbs of Solomon. A merry heart doeth good like medicine, but a broken spirit dryeth the bone. Uh-huh. Yes. He believed in giving up all the physical appetite, smoking, overeating, and drinking. <laughs> yes, and above all, he believed in being cheerful. He, he dealt with the drink problem with an enormous gaiety. Well, he's dead. He, what? His body was discovered early this morning. Well, you don't say. Where? Right near his house, in a ditch on the parkway. What happened? Nobody knows. But according to the police, it looks like murder. Uh, did you say his, clo uh, his house is close to the parkway? Yes, on an embankment just above it. Well, what makes the police think it wasn't an accident, Flambeau? Well, he was wearing only his dressing gown. And another strange thing, Father. A small piece of rope was tied around one of his ankles. Was any weapon found? No, but it was apparent he'd been struck on the head by a huge instrument of some sort. Cuts and bruises on his body showed signs of a struggle. Well, who put you on the case? Oh, no one. The dead man's secretary, Robert Royce, uh -huh. is an old friend of mine. Okay. I called him as soon as I heard the news and offered him my services as private investigator. But he, he refused to see me. Well, that's strange. No, yet, yet, no. Not so strange if he were implicated. Who else is there beside Royce in the household? Just Armstrong's daughter. A very attractive girl, I hear, but completely dominated by her father's cheerfulness. Uh -huh. And there's also a gardener, I believe. And uh, your friend Royce, uh, well, what sort of man is he? Oh, he's a huge, genial sort of fellow, a Scotsman. Did he and Armstrong get along well together? Well, Royce was devoted to him. Ah, yes. Armstrong had many devoted followers. You know, he's always interested me, Flambeau. He puzzled me, in fact. Puzzled you? Yes. When, when first I heard him lecture, I, I remember thinking that he had a troublesome road ahead. I believe that somewhere in his life, you'll find a secret of his death. But, Father, according to the papers, he lived as he preached. Oh, yes, I know, I know, Flambeau. The old fellow's optimism was phenomenal. But somehow I don't believe he found that easy road to heaven, as he called it. No? No. Neither have I. There is no shortcut to heaven, my friend. But who would want to kill such a man? Well, if, if ever I murdered somebody, I dare say it might well be an optimist of the proportions of old Armstrong. His optimism was so out of proportion. I've heard cheerfulness referred to as a virtue. Yeah, well, people like frequent laughter, but a permanent smile, Flambeau. Well, now that, that's something else again. As Shakespeare says, the devil hath power to assume a pleasing shape. 
Well, Father, it's six o'clock. We're just in time for the news. Let's turn on the radio. That's a good idea. Perhaps there's something further on the case. Listen. Clear tonight and tomorrow somewhat cooler. Now we bring you a special bulletin just handed me on the Armstrong Yes, yeah, turn us up, Flambo. John Magnus, the gardener, the millionaire philanthropist, has been reported missing. Oh. Also, negotiable bonds for the dead man valued at $100,000. The police received this report only a short while ago and are now conducting a statewide search for the gardener. It is believed... Well, that seems to be the first real clue. Do you mind if I use the phone, Father? Uh, I'd like yeah. to uh, talk to Royce again. Yeah. The call uh, will cost you a nickel. Tax, two cents. That's seven cents. It, it just drop a dime in the poor box on your way out. All right, Father. Hello, Royce. This is Flambeau. Now, wait a minute. We just heard the news about the gardener's disappearance. Oh, hold on, hold on. You remember the friend I was telling you about? Yes, Father Brown. Well, we'd like to come up. What's that? Oh, I don't get it. Royce. Royce. My father, he's hung up. What did he say? He said if we valued our lives, we wouldn't go near that house. Ah, interesting. Well, 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 Flambeau, that's what I call a real invitation. Come on, my friend, let's go. I'm sure there's someone here, Father. Hmm. Ring again, Flambeau. Ah, here's someone now. Yes? What do you want? Oh, good evening, Royce. So it's you, Flambeau. I thought I warned you plain enough over the phone. You did. But look here, Royce. I don't understand... It was plain English I spoke. I know, but you sounded like you were in trouble. Well, I'm not. Oh, come, man. Don't act as though we weren't friends. Oh, this is Father Brown. Ah, uh, I gathered as much. Um, Mr. Royce, I, I, I'm afraid I'm to blame for this visit. Well, it was good to be here to come, Father, but I wish you'd both heeded my warning. Man, what kind of a friend would I have been if I had? I tell you, the police have already investigated. I know, I know. I've talked with them. Uh, perhaps we can help you, Mr. Royce. Help? In what way? Well, uh, maybe we could tell better if you'd ask us in. Very well. You may come in. What you should have let sleep in dogs lie, Flambeau. <laughs> Well, Royce, I must confess I can't find anything here in Armstrong's room that tells us very much. And just what did you expect to find? Mr. Rice. Yes? Uh, what do you make of the gardener's disappearance? Magnus is a fool, maybe a thief, but he never killed Mr. Armstrong. I'm sure it was the deed of a madman. Uh, I see. My, my, my. Well, I would never have expected those to be there. Father, what are you looking at? Well, that pair of socks over there thrown under the bureau. Oh, they should be in the bureau drawer. Here, I'll put them away. Uh, wait, uh, may I have a look at those bureau drawers, Mr. Rice? What for? Well, I'd just like to look. What are you searching for? And I'll take a peep at that closet, too, if you don't mind. Well, now that's funny. What, Father? Everything looked so neat when we came in. Mr. Armstrong was always very particular. Everything is in order on the surface. But underneath, underneath... Things look different. What things? Well, in the closet, his socks are stuffed in the hangers with the suits. And in the bureau drawers, under those beautifully laid-out shirts... Yes? A whole lot of ginger spilled from a box. Why do you have to go on with this? The police went over the room very thoroughly. The room, perhaps. But they seem to have missed this piece of rope. Look here. I found it caught in the vine just below the ledge of the window. Well, it couldn't have been there this morning that the police would have found it. Well, I just saw the wind blow an end of it out from under the vine. Royce, maybe you can tell me how this piece of rope got there. What has that got to do with the case? You know perfectly well a piece of rope was tied around the leg of the dead man. That rope in your hand was left from fixing the windows. Well, now, I'm just wondering. Wonder wondering what, Father? Well, let me take a look out of that window. Why? For a very good reason. The police haven't yet established why the dead man was found on the parkway. No. No, that isn't it. The window isn't high enough for the, from the ground for him to have fallen. Or been pushed or to have jumped. Right. And not high enough for his body to have rolled down the embankment to the parkway. Mr. Rice, 
Uh, isn't there another floor to this house? Uh, there's only an attic. Mm. Robert? Robert? That's Miss Armstrong. She's been much upset since her father's death. Oh, yes, yes, of course. You'll have to excuse me for a moment. Certainly. Father, hmm. I don't like the look of things. This rope I found in the vine was cut with a sharp instrument. The rope found on Armstrong's ankle was also cut with a sharp instrument. Hmm. And did you notice the cut on Royce's knuckle? Yes, yes, I did, Flambeau. But, uh, you know, I haven't noticed any geniality. He's hardly the person you described to me. Yes, I know, Father. Didn't like him. Nevertheless, it seems to fit his unshaven appearance. It's the first time I've ever seen him that way, either. You're worried about your friend's innocence, aren't you? Oh, I know how the mind of a thief works, Father. I was once a thief myself. But murder... You think he's capable of murder? Well, the answer to that one is more up your alley, Father. Well, in any event, he's hiding something. But I think there is a secret in this house more important than his. And I'm very anxious to find out what it is. Now, first, look at the stains on the wall. And, and you felt the dust on the banisters as we came up. Well? Well, but the, 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 the question fairly screams at us, Flambeau. What question? Why are there no servants in this house? Ah, well, Armstrong certainly had plenty of money. He could afford them. Mm -hmm. There could only be one reason. If the old man himself had something to hide. Father, you mean you think Armstrong... Well, I... Miss Armstrong's in the drawing room downstairs. She'd like to talk to you, Father Brown. If you will please follow me. <laughs> And I, I hesitate to continue, Miss Armstrong. I, I know how badly you feel. Please go on, Father Brown. I'm quite all right. But that bruise on your forehead, Miss Armstrong. Oh, that's nothing. It doesn't bother me. I bumped it. Your father had a great many followers, didn't he? Oh, yes, he helped so many people. Do you know why your father decided to give up all his servants? Well, great men like my father have their peculiarities. Their ideas are often different from other people's. Yes, very true, Mr. Royce, very true. I was only wondering... Wait. This... What? This... Someone's unlocking the front door. Who could it be? No one has a key besides us. Who's that? Me, Magnus. Magnus? Yes, Miss Armstrong. Magnus. And here is Inspector Vincent. Well, how are you, Inspector? Fine, Father Brown, fine. Uh, hello, Flambeau. I might have known you two would be here. Well, I see you got your man, Inspector. Is this the gardener who walked out of here with $100,000 worth of bonds? Walked out of here and right into my office to place them in my charge. Hello, Royce. Right. Uh, are you feeling better, Miss Armstrong? Yes, thank you, Inspector. Now, Magnus, perhaps you'd care to tell Miss Armstrong why you took those bonds without consulting her. No one in this household is to be trusted. Not even Miss Armstrong. Now, see here, Magnus. Just a minute, Royce. What I want to know... Why did you wait so long before reporting this gardener's absence? We didn't think much of it, Inspector, until I noticed the bonds were gone, too. I was waiting for you to report it. Magnus has been telling me some very interesting things. A new angle on the case, Inspector? Well, it closes the case if Magnus is telling the truth. Inspector, what this man says is not to be taken seriously. He's not been himself. What makes you say that? Magnus used to be my father's personal valet, Inspector. But he was taken off that and put to work in the garden. He's been very upset. He thought it was quite a come down. Hmm. Upset, am I? Well, I like that. I wasn't going to tell the inspector about you two being in love. But now Be I... Be careful guess... what you say, Magnus. You weren't so careful what you said when I heard you two talking in the garden the other night. Magnus. I've stood enough of this. Take it easy, Royce. Inspector, may I make a suggestion? Uh, just I... a minute, Father Brown. Magnus, what are you getting at? About four nights ago it was. I heard them in the garden. He was begging her to marry him. They didn't know I was close by. No. No, Robert, we mustn't. But, Alice, you've no life of your own. Let's face your father now. Let's tell him how much we love each other. Oh, but, Robert, we must wait. We really ought to. I know how important you are to his work, but what about our, our life? We can't go on waiting forever. Oh, but, Robert, it won't be forever. Oh, darling, you know I love you. You must be sure of that. I am sure, my dearest. 
Oh, if only I could get my hands on some money. What do you mean, Robert? I'd make you marry me then, Alice. Oh, Robert. I feel guilty even thinking of it. We mustn't, my darling. Not now. So long as he's alive. I'll find some way out of this. Shh. I thought I heard someone. We better not talk here. Come. Come, my dear. Well, that's all I could hear. But I suspected them what they were up to, and now I know. Uh, you know what? That they would be off with the money. Mr. Armstrong's money. The money he had wanted to be used for his work. Inspector, this talk is ridiculous. You don't Mr. think... Mr. Royce, do you use an old-fashioned razor? I? You didn't use it today. Why? Why, I... I mislaid it. When? I don't know. Since, since I last shaved, I guess. That was yesterday. You can tell by his beard. Magnus brought your razor into the precinct with him with the bonds. I'm holding it as evidence. Why? Because it had a smear of blood on it. Oh, well, I must have cut myself shaving and forgot to wipe it. Oh, Inspector, is this all the evidence you have of Royce's guilt? Who said anything about Royce's guilt? Now, Magnus, tell them what you told me just now in the office. I was sleeping in my room over the garage, and about four this morning I heard shots. Followed by loud outcries, which seemed to come from the attic. An instant later, I I saw Mr. Armstrong's body pitch from the window and roll down the embankment. When I made sure he was dead, I rushed up to the attic and found his daughter unconscious on the floor with a razor in her hand. You mean Miss Armstrong killed her father? It's a lie! Surely, Father Brown, you for one will take Miss Armstrong's word against his gardeners. But is Miss Armstrong's word against him? So far, she has said nothing. Miss Armstrong... Can't you speak? Magnus told the truth. There, you see? I'll get you for this. I'll Magnus. get you. Here now. Oh, you'll not say things like that. I will and I do. Royce, go on. Let go. None of that, Royce. Or I'll arrest you for assault. No. You'll arrest me for murder. Robert. But, man, you've been Armstrong's best friend. What possessed you? I was drunk. Sure. Didn't I find those empty bottles hidden in the garden? Piling up week after week? Sure. I knew what was going on here. Now, now, Magnus, you've told your story. Let Royce tell his. Maybe he was too drunk to remember. Miss Armstrong did not pick up the razor to attack, but to defend her father from me. In the scuffle, she hit her head against the eaves of the attic. I hurried down to get something to revive her, and it must have been then that Magnus came in and found her. Oh, Robert. Robert. All right, Royce. Come along. Uh, wait, Inspector, before you arrest Royce. What is it now, Father Brown? Well, so far we've had opinions and confessions. But we haven't had facts. And we need facts. And where do you think we'll find them? In the attic. In the attic? Uh, yes, Inspector. Perhaps by climbing a few steps nearer heaven, we can come closer to this evil. <laughs> Father, I can't figure out what you expect to find in this attic. Uh, you you sleep here, don't you, Mr. Royce? Aye. And Mr. Armstrong slept in the room immediately below this. Aye, but why all these questions? Well, now, in the first place, Mr. Royce, uh, why did you bring your victim up here at the crack of dawn in order to kill him? Why didn't you go to his room? Well? I confess. Isn't that enough? Well, confession is good for the soil, it's granted, but, uh, Inspector... You, you remember Magnus telling us he was awakened by shots? Yes. What about those shots, Inspector? Were any bullets found in Armstrong's body? Well, we investigated and didn't find a one. Wait, uh, wait. Here is my pistol. I fired those shots. You can see the holes in the carpet. Well, why should anybody fire at the carpet? A drunken man will let fly at anything. Uh, he doesn't pick a quarrel with his feet. And there's the rope. It was from my window here that Armstrong was thrown. And the piece of rope I found fell to the vines below. What about the blow on the head? According to our report, he was struck by a massive weapon. A massive weapon indeed, Inspector. Sure, the good green earth was the weapon. Okay, so the good green earth was the weapon. But look, this room was the beginning of the murder. Even I can see from the disorder. Come on, Royce. Let's go. But the disorder here is all on the surface. The very opposite of Armstrong's room. No, no, it doesn't fit. Too many inconsistencies. Father Brown, Royce has given himself up. No, 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 no. Really, this won't do at all. 
What won't do? Well, first the police said no weapon was found at all. Now we're finding too many. Too many? Now, there's the razor to cut a person, the rope to strangle, the pistol to shoot, and after all this, Armstrong broke his skull falling out of a window. No, 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 no. It won't do. It's not economical. Alice, they won't believe me. You tell them. Inspector. Yes, young lady. May I speak to Father Brown alone for a moment? If you must... But be quick. We can't wait around here all night. And now what is it, my child? What is it that you wish to say? You're trying to save Robert. But it's no use. I should have realized before this his case is hopeless. Before he came to us, he was a prisoner of war. He had some shocking experiences. Well, you think that was the reason for his drinking? Yes, he wasn't himself at times. Mm. We thought he was getting over it, but... Father... I saw Robert commit the crime myself. Hmm. I heard the shots. I ran up just in time to see him leap at my father. Where was your father standing? He was clinging to the windowsill in terror. But uh, the rope... Robert tried to strangle him with it. Father fought back and the rope slipped from his shoulders to his feet, tightening around the leg. Robert was like a maniac. I snatched the razor from the floor and managed to cut the rope before he pushed me against uh, the ears. Miss eaves. Armstrong, what we see with our eyes is sometimes farthest from the truth. Now, you thought that you saw a man about to commit murder. What you actually saw was two men struggling. And then you lost consciousness. But, Father Brown... I want you to go downstairs, my dear. I don't understand. Go on now, please. Do as I say. Very well. Thank you, my dear. Well, Father Brown, I've seen and heard enough to convince me... Unless you know something pretty startling, I'm taking Royce down and booking him. If you don't mind, Inspector, I'd like to talk to Royce a bit before you do. What about, Father? Oh, where's Alice? She's out of earshot, Mr. Royce. So why don't you tell us about it now? Tell you about what? I see. Well, then I'll tell you, Inspector. Those three tools of death were not used to kill Armstrong, but to save him. Save him? Father, I don't get this. Save him from what? From himself. At the time old Armstrong died, he was a suicidal maniac. No, Royce, you weren't drinking. No? No, and you were the only one who knew what lurked behind old Armstrong's laughter. No, no. Yes, you knew what uh, that behind that merry mask was the mind of an atheist. No. A man who knew nothing of God. He didn't realize until it was too late that human beings need something to worship greater than themselves. I warn Flambeau not to bring you here, Father. I was afraid it might come to this. Well, man, what harm is there in the truth now? Alice must never know. Why? Why shouldn't she be told that you weren't the enemy her father feared? Shall I name the enemy, Royce? All right, Father Brown, you win. This morning, Armstrong was determined to do away with himself. He knew I kept my service pistol in my dresser. And when he heard me go down to the kitchen early at dawn, he left his room and came up here. And you came in and accidentally surprised him. I, I got the pistol out of his hand, but in the struggle I had no time to unload, so I fired at the carpet. Then he found my razor and tried to slash himself. Mm. I snatched it from him and flung it to the floor. I ran after him with a rope to tie him up. And it was then that the unlucky girl ran in and misunderstanding the struggle. She tried to cut her father free with a razor. She cut the rope, slashing my knuckle just as I pushed her. And he went crashing into eternity out of that window. But, Father Brown, you spoke of an, of an enemy, old man Armstrong, fear. I did, yes. You mean the enemy was in this room with him at the same time as Royce? Yes. Who was it? The sin. The very thing Armstrong was so vehement against. You mean alcohol? It was his worst enemy. The moment I saw the ginger in one of the bureau drawers downstairs, I suspected it was the futile effort of a man who was trying to give up drinking. Isn't that right, Royce? Yes, Father Brown. Armstrong was living a lie, and it preyed on his mind. And he feared his public might find him out. Aye. The more despondent he got, the darker visions he had of failing his followers. The people who looked to him for guidance. So fearful was he of anyone praying into his secret that he hid from his friends and got rid of all his servants. And you were the only one he could confide in. Aye. He didn't understand your loyalty, did he? No, but it was for her sake, you see. And so you kept the knowledge of his spells to yourself. 
letting his daughter believe it was you, the result of the war. Hi. Well, Royce, I can't imagine why you didn't speak up before. Don't you see? It was because she must never know. Never know what? Why, that she killed her own father. I see. By trying to free him. My son, I think she should know. After all, it was only an accident. And accidents, no matter how tragic, do not poison life like sins. I think you should both be happier now. Surely, two private lives are worth more than the public reputation of Aaron Armstrong. Well, Father, at last you're back. Yes, we were worried. Uh, Hello, Nora. Hello, Peter. Have you had dinner? I, uh... No, no, I don't think I have. Oh, that's a shame. I'd better go fix you something right away. Oh, my. It's nice to sit down again. Oh, Peter, you missed your story tonight. I'm sorry. Father, I heard tonight's story. Many versions of it. You did? How? From the news commentators over the radio. Oh. They've been reading bulletins on it every half hour or so. I see. Tell me, Father, what made you suspect Royce wasn't guilty? Well, looking into the hidden places of his attic room convinced me of Royce's innate neatness, Peter. I don't quite see. Well, I I knew that no one as orderly as Royce could commit such a murder. The whole thing was too sloppy. I mean, the three tools of death. But how did you discover that Armstrong was a suicide? Well, the same method, but in reverse. I'm afraid my methods are are not orthodox, Peter. I'm no real detective. To, To me, a man's inner nature must be revealed first. Armstrong's habits revealed his nature just as Royce's did. They justified certain suspicions I had when Flambeau told me of his death. What do you mean? Well, Armstrong's erratic character was uh, clear to me when I looked into his bureau drawers. See, there, there I saw the compartments of his mind. The neatness mixed with the disorder which his friend Royce had tried to cover up. The litter reflecting the mind of the depressed. Surely you had something more than that to prove he was a suicide? Well, uh, yes, Peter, I had myself... Yourself? Yes. I dare say that I would feel as Armstrong did if I had ever preached an easy road to happiness and then had slipped into a ditch by the side of the road. Yes, Father, I see. Yes. Well, now, uh, good night, Father Peter. Good night, Father Brown. <laughs> been listening to The Adventures of Father Brown with Carl Swenson as Father Brown. Father Brown's adventure tonight was called The Three Tools of Death. The character of Father Brown was created by G.K. Chesterton in the detective novels called The Adventures of Father Brown. This is the Armed Forces Radio Service. Welcome back. There are a few things that stand out uh, in this episode where the writers have taken a little bit of license with the Chesterton story, as I'll get into in a second. But this really does, I think, hit on the uh, spirit of the story. 
it does appear they have kind of uh, adapted the story more to uh, modern times. Uh, the Three Tools of Death was published in 1911, uh, and there was no use of a telephone and no use of a radio in the story. Radio was still a relatively new uh, uh, invention. Plus, the show had them using American money and American accents for all of the actors other than uh, Father Brown, uh, with Carl Swenson uh, doing a bit of an, uh, it really seemed to have a bit of an Irish inflection. And that may be part of the reason why uh, the series didn't last as long. I think a lot of people who are fans of the uh, British uh, mysteries in particular expect them to be done uh, exactly uh, right. To be in line with the vision of the author uh, rather than straying for uh, American adaptation. The uh, Poirot radio series had a similar uh, problem. Still, though, for lovers of great mystery stories, I think this was a great uh, performance of a classic with those uh, issues uh, mentioned and addressed. By the way, if you like Father Brown, you may also like a book written by, by a friend of mine, Donna Fletcher Crow. She has a book out called A Very Private Grave. It's the first in a series called The Monastery Mysteries. This installment follows Felicity Howard as she tries to solve the murder of a beloved priest at a monastery. And it takes her all over, to Eng over England as she learns what it was that led to Father Dominic's death. If it sounds interesting, uh, check it out over at uh, greatdetectives.net. We've got it in the sidebar. Well, we have an email from William on our previous series regarding uh, Jeff Regan. Is it just me, or are the Frank Graham episodes of Jeff Regan significantly lighter in tone than the Jack Webb ones? I've noticed it even in little things like the organ music. Take one of the recent episodes that had a subplot about the lion trying to eat healthier, which served no purpose other than to be humorous. And then there's the silly ending with the lion being horrified that Regan turned down an invitation to a barbecue on his half, followed by the organist strumming shortening bread. For me, I'll always remember the web episodes by the moment in one where a man is enumerating a set of points as he's dying, but before he can complete his thoughts, I'm probably remembering it poorly. All I know, it was a very dark moment. Uh, I think, well, you're right. I I've said it before. I, I think the characterization that Frank Graham used uh, was really much more of a uh, uh, of a Richard Rogue, which we're going to hear after we get done with Nero Wolf, which is coming in two weeks, by the way. Um, really uh, used that type of lighter uh, Dick Powell-esque uh, type approach, and I think that was really what uh, they were going for, and. Uh, I think it worked in a lot of uh, a lot of humor. I think it was still in the hard-boiled genre, and in fact, they even reused uh, at least one script uh, from the Jack Webb era with a few uh, changes. So, good observation. We've been writing about uh, old-time radio music, um, and uh, Karen uh, writes in on Facebook, "Hey Adam, how about P. Kelly's Blues?" Will we ever get a chance to hear this one? I've fallen for Jack Webb. Thanks for all your hard work. I love the show. And Patrick uh, put in a like on that as well. Uh, Pete Kelly's Blues is on the list of shows that I want to do. It'll be a while till I get to it. Um, in retrospect, the one thing I, I thought about uh, after we'd already started into the schedule is that it would have been better not to bunch... Uh, Pat Novak, uh, Johnny Madero, and Jeff Regan all together, because that takes the vast majority of web-led detective shows already done. So I'll wait a while on Pete Kelly's Blues, but if you are a subscriber to the Dragnet podcast, that is going to be uh, one of our quarterly extras, I think, coming up in uh, January. And you can follow that over at RadioDragnet.com. But that'll do it for today. Got a common email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Cast your vote for the show on Podcast Alley, podcastalley.greatdetectives.net. And please uh, follow us over on Twitter at Radio Detectives. Uh, from Boise, Idaho, though, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.